The story of football at Towson University begins in 1966, which is when Donald Doc Minigan, who was the athletics director at the time, produced a feasibility study. Minigan sees sports as an opportunity to grow a person and grow a person as um, somebody who would give back to society. And that is something that he brought with him because he was the coach here during World War II. And one of his major concerns was that any student he sent out into war would be prepared for what they would encounter. He saw athletics as a much bigger thing. It uh, informed a person. It made you think about your community, your team, your school in a way that if you just came in and you got your degree and left again, you might not think of the school in the same way. So the feasibility study is done, uh, the budget is created, uh, they're into uh, buying equipment, uh, they've hired uh, uh, a head coach, Richard uh, Smith. Richard Smith was a former coach at Wesley Junior College in Dover, Delaware. He brought me here from Wesley, and then I rolled here in the spring of 1968. I came back in the summer, and Coach Smith wasn't there. And it's uh, two weeks before practice begins, and uh, there's a bit of a calamity because the head coach resigns for personal reasons. You know, only at Towson would you have a feasibility study. You would hire a coach. He comes in, sets the stage. Two weeks before the season starts, he quits. And in the end, Towson is the first school to ever make the playoffs in Division III, Division II, and FCS football. Only at Towson. Doc Medigan came to me and he said, there's been a request that you take over football. We finally agreed that I would take football and I told him that I'd need a coach. And I called Phil Albert and I told Phil if he'd come up with me, I, you know, it's a new program, we're starting together. And anyhow, he said, well, coach, when do you want me there? And I said, well, when do you think you can get here, Phil? He said, I'll be there tomorrow. And dang if he wasn't, he was there the next day. He tells me all this great thing, what we're going to do here at this uh, at Towson. So me and my wife, we, we get in our car. So we show up here. We got two weeks to camp. Uh, I asked Grunk where we're going to play. And, uh, and he says, he tells me, like, right here. And I'm saying, like, yeah, but right here, but right where? Where's the, where's the stadium? Where's the, he says, no, nah, that's gonna, they're going to put some lines on this field. <laughs> and, you know, we go in, where's the locker room? There's no locker room. We're actually going to dress underneath the swimming pool. It's a billion degrees in August, man. Uh, it, it's just unbelievable. I'm like, are you kidding? Football at Towson premieres today as the new junior varsity gritters face Ursinus in a scrimmage at 3.30 p.m. The squad will work under new head coach Carl Runk. When practice began, there were 80 men out for the team. Presently, the squad has 40 members who have stayed. No one was cut. No one was cut. So 40 left. So how did, where did 40 players go? We had a lot of kids turn out for practice the first day. We came out of Burdick Hall. There was a walkway 
about where Birdie Call is, it came down onto the field. The field ran this way. We know we're going to play in a couple of weeks, and we've got a lot of guys just watching them in the agilities that there's no way. You know, it's kind of like there's no way. We come in after maybe a session, and Runk says to me, man, we got a lot of guys. I said, I know. He said, well, I'm going to come up with a drill, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to run this drill. We're not going to put no time limit on it. We're just going to run this drill, and, and everybody who can't take it, I'm going to stand in the middle of the field. I'm going to tell them, you just run by me, and you tell me you can't take it. I'm going to tell you, go ahead and turn your equipment in. <laughs> we told the kids that, uh, you know, do us a favor. Just don't quit. Tell us you're quitting. Have the, have the courage, have the courtesy to tell us, I can't take it, I'm quitting. Runk sets up the drill, and uh, he says, we're going to sprint for 50 yards. We're going to, uh, what do you call that, crab for 50 yards. Then we're going to duck walk across the back of the end zone. Then we're going to shimmy up the goalpost. We're going we're gonna to hand walk across, and we're going to shimmy down. And then we're going to go again. I mean, it was just attrition by Exhaustion. <laughs> no reason to fool around with them. Let's get right down. Who can take it? Who, you know, who can you depend on? And pretty soon, here goes one guy. I can't take it. Another guy, can't take it. Can't take it. The kids would yell from across the field, hey, coach, I'm quitting. I can't take it. And, hey. We had like 35 players left when the, uh, when the drill <laughs> was over. And that's what we began with. The kids we ended up with were a great bunch of kids. That drill set the tone for Towson University football. After the season's over, I was called up to the main office to visit with the president. So I went up and I thought it was going to be a discussion between the president and myself. And when I walked in, there was a long table, eight chairs on one side and one chair on the other. And I thought to myself, boy, this just doesn't look right. You know, what the heck's going on here? And the secretary, she brings me into the room. She says, go trunk. She says, you'll sit here. Well, that's what I did. I sat down and then they all came in. They had a, the dean's council, all the deans. They had the president, they had the admissions director, and we sat down and the president said, uh, Coach Runk has come to our attention that you and your staff are going out and you're visiting high schools and you're handing out uh, information about Towson University. I said, yeah, I said, we do that. We got to go, we, we try to go to different schools. We're trying to recruit youngsters to come to Towson to play football. And he says, well, we find that that's unnecessary. And I thought to myself, you've got to be kidding me. So we went, I went back down and coach said, how'd it go, uh, Coach Runk, how'd it go? I said, Phil, you're not going to like what you're going to hear. This is what they said. He said, what are we going to do? I said, well, come with me. I said, we're going up to the admissions office. And I went back and I got a box of applications. It must have weighed 50 pounds. I thought I was going to drop to my knees carrying that out. And I told him, I said, Phil, if we're going down, buddy, we're going down swinging. <laughs> Most people know how loyal uh, Coach Runk was to our players, to the university. But see, I think that's what players love about the, Coach Runk. Tough, in your face, holds you accountable, but loves you. I was scared to death of him when I was a player. <laughs> but, you know, I came to find out through the years, you know, I would come down to his office when I was head coach and just sit there and talk to him. And, you know, that, that's the thing that most people don't understand how the kind of man he is to you. And he'd give you everything he got, his heart and his soul. Carl, what's the total number of years you were here? 40, 42, 40, 41 or 42. If that doesn't scream, lo like I'm looking at all of us, but you started this. If that doesn't scream loyalty, the people would probably look at all of us like 50 years and only four coaches. That's because of you. One of the foundations that nobody ever talks about is loyalty. That we've been, we've all been loyal to this school. Lost characteristic. Loyal to the kids, loyal to the cause, loyal to the town and the community. No matter what the circumstances, especially when everything's stacked up against you, you started that. Thank you. Amen. 
I think Carl was really getting Phil ready uh, to become the head coach so he could step down. So he steps down and gives it to Phil. I don't think anybody really still at that time knew where the program was going. And Phil was able to bring these kids together and make them believe. I mean, what, 1974, they go undefeated? That's, that's what, that's five years after the program started? That's phenomenal, five years and you go undefeated? Starting from scratch. As an achiever, you wanna, get, you wanna do it again. So we kinda of set our sights on, let's just continue to get better, let's continue to work hard. And we did, and we found ourselves in the Division Three National Championship. So for the first three quarters, it's not looking too good. Now we're down 28 to nothing. There's 12 minutes and 40 seconds left to go. And Dan Delight started to do his thing. And he brought us back. And within you know a minute or so to go in the game, it's 28 all. Kicked off to them, they made a couple of big plays. And then uh, they had a kid by the name of Jeff Norman. And uh, with uh, 19 seconds left, he kicks a you know, 32 yard field goal to win it 31-28. But uh, it was a great game, you know, a great comeback. I, I know Phil was just absolutely devastated and took a lot out of, you know, all the kids too. But uh, I think it's a moment that they can, they can all share. And uh, I mean, whether it's Division Three, Division Two, or FCS, how many college football players go through their careers without playing for something like that, you know, and these kids did. Dan DeLay is what I would characterize as the Pied Piper for Towson football. Certainly a quality quarterback, he was a charismatic leader, and we started throwing the ball. After Dan, now it's Ron Meehan, well, the offense became known as Air Albert. You look at you know, receivers in motion constantly. He had that, he had shotgun, he had pistol. He had things that people hadn't thought of until 20 years later, and he was doing all of that because he didn't have enough pieces for a full puzzle. He had to be creative and he came up with all kinds of stuff that's kind of staple in football today, so he was way ahead of his time. And I truly, truly believe that it's the system that was put in place for us to be successful. Everybody talks about athletics at this institution and Doc Minigan, his name is on everything. And truth be told, none of this exists without him. But when it comes to football, this is Phil Albert. Now, there are other hands involved. You know, Rich Bader was there forever. Cody Combs was there forever. Carl was there at the inception. But where we stand today, this is all Phil Albert. He's the guy that directed it. He's the guy that had the vision for it. He's the guy that stood out in front, first guy through the wall, and became bloody because of it. But yeah, we're not Towson football today without Phil. Have you ever been around Coach Albert? Coach Albert, when you talk with this guy, you walk away feeling better about yourself, you know. He is pure. He's a pure person. He's full of love. He's got more love in him than anybody you'll ever meet. The whole thing with me was to speak into the life of those who we had. I'm going to relate to players. I'm going to invest my life in them. See, individually, we probably weren't very talented, but together, we believed that we were, you know, we were a lot better together than we were, you know, individually. Coach A and the coaching staff inspired you. He lifted you up, he challenged you. He motivated you to go above and beyond. He didn't motivate you by fear or negative motivation. He's a true leader, a mentor. He was raising men. He wanted you to be a good father. He wanted you to be a good member of the community. He wanted you to be a good person. And he knew that football could help you do that. He is without a doubt one of the best storytellers I've ever met in my life. The kind of person that can make a room quiet and he can teach you his point through a tale in a way that not only do you hear it and understand it, but you will remember it for life. One of the stories that Coach Howard always talked about was the big potato. You know, when the farmer would bring the potatoes to the market and the truck would bounce, all the big potatoes would come to the top. And that's what he said, we were big potatoes. It was always pertinent to the, what we were playing that, 
that week or that game. I mean, the one that always stuck out to me is the one I use now is the haze in the barn. We would get to the end of practice. And, you know, you knew you had to maybe do sprints or something at the very end. You'd be, you'd be in on the field for three hours. You're exhausted. You're hot. You're starting to drag. You have that last little bit of work to get done. And he would always say, come on, guys. Hayes in the barn. Let's just wrap it up. And it stuck with me, that idea of run through the finish line, put it away, make sure it's all done. So years later, about 10 years ago, I'm doing a Ravens broadcast, and there's that signature play with about two minutes left that seals the win. And I apparently said, the Hayes in the barn. And the haze in the barn. Well, I didn't even realize I said it, but that week so many people said it back to me that it just stuck. Well, that's Phil Albert. Those are the things that pass on. I couldn't have been any luckier. Couldn't have played for a better head coach. Just number one, just a quality person. A lot of enthusiasm. You always felt he was in your corner. Also, if he had to come down on you, he would. You know, when I think back, he was just a terrific head coach. Sean Landetta is a classic, only a Towson story. You're not expecting to find one of the great NFL punters of all time on the practice field. Only a Towson would that happen. You know, it's interesting if I think about it, Towson actually chose me in the sense that they offered me a scholarship. And to me, they wanted me. Most kids in high school that are very good players, all of us want to play at Notre Dame and Ohio State and Alabama and USC. Most of us, don't get offered scholarships there, or most of us will end up at a place like Towson. So it's almost like, hey, we all feel we're pretty good players. And, you know, even though we weren't there, we're here. So, you know, it's almost like a little underdog thing. Like, you know, we, we're all good football players, and just because we couldn't play there, well, we're going to play here, and we're going to be really good. And, uh, you know, I think that might be the glue, if you will. Uh, you know, and all of us looking back, we're so glad we played here. We really are. Because in the end, these are the people that wanted us. So Sean was a freak of nature, an unbelievable talent. You know, this talent people saw in the NFL, we saw at Towson. Only at Towson could you look up on fourth down and see a guy punting the ball 70 yards. And what people don't realize, Sean was a great kicker too. He was the only player in college football history in the same season to lead the nation in kicking and punting. Sean was a very confident player. I mean, very confident, but he had the skills to back it up. He had the chops. But midway through training camp one day, we're all like in the huddle, it's 95 degrees, we're bent over. It's kind of day you bend over and the sweat just pours out of your helmet. The guys are gasping. You're only halfway through the, through the workout. And Sean sticks his head in the huddle and says, I don't know why you guys are all working so hard. We all know I'm the only one who's going to the NFL. We're like 11 guys chasing him down the field. Shut up, Sean, get out of here. And he had that playful ability to say that stuff and still be a lovable character and part of the team. But he was right. We all knew he was going to the NFL. He was that good. Sean Landetta comes on the field to punt. So Sean Landetta is the first Towson football player to play in a professional football game. And they got a chance to down it deep. And they do at the one. If I'm the first, I guess I'm realizing it now. I never knew that until right now. You know, I can remember how great it was just, wow, this is really going to happen, something I've always hoped it would happen. And when I went on to play in the NFL, uh, my first team, the New York Giants, you know, I can remember uh, my teammate Lawrence Taylor pulling me aside and saying, hey, Landetta, you know, where are the blanks Towson State? And I had to laugh. I'm like, you're from, you're from Virginia, man. He goes, yeah, but I've never heard of the place. I said, we're in Baltimore. He goes, oh, OK. And a lot of people just didn't know where it was. But uh, uh, growing up here, I did. I didn't know where Towson was until I made my first visit, my recruiting visit there. Growing up in the inner city, especially the time that I grew up, growing up in Baltimore, northwest Baltimore, we're generally surrounded by our own. So I get to Towson with individuals from all over, uh, different races, different backgrounds, and so on and so forth. We're on my mother and father's farm that I grew up on. Looking back on it, it was awesome. But when you're living it and you're a teenager, you don't get to do the things that other kids get to do because you're always working. My relationship with Bill Stuck. We come from different worlds. He's a country boy from Frederick. I'm an inner city wire guy from Baltimore. We 
clicked immediately. Rodney was a, was a great athlete, easy to talk to guy. He was a nose guard and I was a D tackle and we kind of hit it off, you know, even though we were quite different. Towson football, it brought a group of guys from different places, different races, and none of that stuff mattered. What mattered is that when we stepped on the field, the whistle blew. It was on and popping for one goal. And no other sport that I believe really does that like football. Well, I think uh, Rodney and I's story is a football story. Towson was the part of the football piece that brought us there. And we just had a common goal. We, we both wanted to play football and we both wanted to win. I learned a lot about being successful on the football field from Bill Stuck and, and being locker mates with him, being a part of him and his family. I enjoyed watching his boys play at Towson. Two of my four sons played at Towson. My oldest son, Billy, and Brady. Being able to kind of listen about my dad's stories was, was awesome. Um, and then kind of being able to kind of walk those footsteps, kind of stay in the dorms, kind of like the same ones he was in, that thing was definitely cool. Sharing that with my dad and my brother, it, it's, it's awesome, because we, we'll sit, sit around and, and tell stories, even across the coaches, because, you know, my dad had Coach Albert, me and Billy had Coach Ambrose, and it's pretty much the same thing. And then hopefully he'll get a chance to see my son play at Towson. To follow my father's footsteps, it's become to mean a lot to me. At first, I really didn't think about it, but the bond that some are going to have for a long time, even when I'm done playing, to say that we both played for the Towson Tigers is, is really deep. And, and that's the beauty of not only football, but Towson football. We were taught love. We were taught to get it and pass it on. Runk did it when he started the program, and of course, Phil Albert, Coach Albert, Coach A did it, and he passed it down to Gordy, and, and Rob is, is taking the reins and doing the same thing with his young men to pass it on. That was one thing that was never in question. Coach A loved you. Phil found a way to always make us know that we were loved no matter what we did and that we still had a chance to, to be better because of that. And it's been in every single thing, everything you've said, everything you've taught, every kid you've coached, they all love you. Probably because they owe it to you. Because you love them more than they even knew they were loved. Pumping iron is a ritual most football players observe during the off season, and Towson State is no different. Only here, they understand the real meaning of motivation. <coughs> A motivation that comes from suffering through their worst season ever. We had had success at Division Three and Division Two, and everyone just expected that the natural course of events was like that. But that's like saying, you know, I drove a Toyota, I drove a Honda, and I did it really well against Toyotas and Hondas, but now I'm in a NASCAR race, and all I got is my Honda. And eventually we figured out that that wasn't going to work. When we moved to 1AA, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're ready and we're going to do this. Well. We weren't. And then, uh, as you know, in uh, 1990, now they're talking about discontinuing the football program. I mean, you talk about a tough time. Towson did almost get rid of football. The president at that time was Hoke Smith. It was a hard time for the school. They, there wasn't a lot of money, so he didn't see the value of football as much as others. I guess they had done some fiscal discussions, and you know, football is the most expensive sport by a lot. And unless you can fully understand what football can do for your university, if you don't understand that, all that is is a bottom line number to you. So Hoke Smith couldn't see the value of the football program. He just saw it as a bottom line expense item that was too big for his budget. Why do we have this? And he never saw the role in bringing the community together, in bringing alumni together, in bringing generations together, and in bringing more talent to the university. We had a meeting about, um, about dropping football. What do you plan to do when you're desperate? I guess that's probably a good way to describe it. And even at a young age, I knew that they were talking about dropping football and they were gonna take away the thing that I loved the most that had a lot to do with my own personal identity from where I came from. 
they were going to take it away in a place that I called and chosen to make my home. So they, the university decides to have this open hearing, packed student union room. We're here today to listen to you concerning matters of money, specifically, I would guess, football at Towson State University. They're, they're going to have a dialogue. And, and I say that this way because you sense that they had already made up their mind. They were disbanding this. The proposal reads as follows. The Intercollegiate Athletic Committee recommends to suspend the football program at Towson State University after the 1990 season. I have a list somewhere here of people who would like to speak. People from generations came, people from the community came. The passion levels were so high, people were so adamant, people were, were you know, speaking from the heart. Thank you. Uh, Joseph Collins. I'm a walk-on from Cal State football team. I spent a lot of hard work and hard. I paid for my own tuition. I have a game play this Saturday. I maybe have six plays. I'm doing down there with everything I have. Because as far as I'm concerned, it sounds like you are a major decision. As wrong as it may be, as disheartening as it may be. That afternoon at the Union, it seemed like it just went on forever. We, we try to keep this for two hours if, if, if possible. And it was one person after another just up there and how much Towson football meant to them. And it wasn't just players. It was other people in the university. Mr. Bockenfelder, these coaches who are over here to my left, Phil Albert. You know, Phil Albert is Towson State football. He built the program for the past 22 years to what it is today. And I know what the record is as far as one loss on the field, but it goes a lot deeper than that. He's made a commitment to the individuals who participate in the program as the players. He's also made a commitment to this institution because I know there's many a year when Castle State football was up here, riding across the winning season and winning championships, when Phil Albert has said, see y'all later going to a bigger program, but he didn't. He stayed here because of his commitment. And that type of commitment that I think that we need to make to the program. I listened to a lot of people talk, and a lot of people said a lot of good things. I still don't quite understand why we were there to begin with. I, and when I went back and listened to what it is that I had to say, it, to this day, I still don't understand why we were there to begin with. Yeah, you have a hard decision to make, yet I, as a football player and a student, have to live through it. I come from a town where football is very important. It's part of your education. People go to see games. I, I tell you, everybody in this room is here to say, we don't want the program dropped. We'll get the money together, okay? <laughs> There's a movement through the parents to raise the money. It's not their job, but they're gonna do it anyhow. Uh, you asked me about what I thought, about how I sounded once I heard that tape. <sighs> I don't know, like a impassioned young guy who cares more than his brain can catch up. Uh, I might have said a couple decent things in there. But as you guys remind me that all this happened it's a million moons ago, I guess I was doing then what I'm still doing now. And that's just trying to keep this thing moving forward. Trying to get everybody else to see what Towson football can be and what Towson football can do for this university. And I guess in some small way I've been doing it my whole life. Please don't worry, we still have self-worth. As players, we have each other. Thank you. Ironically, it was galvanizing. It brought people together. The football program was saved because all of a sudden they realized this is part of our university that does bring people together. I guess it was the day that saved Towson football because if, if, if nobody had shown up that day, we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about 50 years of Towson football. The 90s were a transitional time, I think, for Towson football. We had been at the 1AA level for five, six years, and then Gordy Combs takes over. Gordy Combs will be the new skipper calling the shots for the Tigers this fall, and he can't wait to get his troops out on the field. We had really struggled in 1AA football. Dan Crowley got us over the hump. He had the guts to throw the football when he had to. But he was such a competitor. I mean, I think that's what made him a great quarterback. In addition 
to having a really good arm. His numbers are staggering. Dan Crowley was a tremendous football player. But I think more importantly, he was a tremendous teammate. I think his teammates loved him. I've always wanted to, to be the locker room guy, right? You need to be the best person in the locker room if you want a chance to win, right? Camaraderie wins championships, talent doesn't. Towson holds a special place because of the opportunities it provided me. And then I look back to the past. Tradition at quarterback was a staple when I arrived. You know, it started in 1969 with Al Dodds. Dan DeLay came along 1974. You know, Dan DeLay is one of those guys that put up big numbers. After Dan DeLay, Ron Meehan comes in, right? So then big Ron, great numbers. You know, another, somebody you look at in that record book and Ron Meehan was always at the top. And Kurt Bethard might have been the next quarterback, right? Kurt Bethard, big name, great locker room guy. Brett Rogers, another one. Brett Rogers could really throw it. I took over for Chris Getz. Chris Getz, four-year starting quarterback. Joe Lee set the single season record for most yards. And then Sean Schaefer takes over the helm. Sean Schaefer's gonna be a Towson Football Hall of Famer. That's what college football is all about. Scoring points, who's at the helm, that's what I like about the quarterback position. I am in a position here now, working at Towson, where I'm able to talk to these players from all these different eras. And what do they always talk about? They talk about the coaching staff. To me, that's family when you can create a coach that can relate to a player that turns into a tradition. What I love the best about Towson was our players. You know, I, I just loved our players. Coach Gordy Combs was the one who, who gave me an opportunity. When I first started playing at Towson, we, uh, it wasn't the Atlantic 10, it was the Patriot League, I believe. And, you know, they weren't giving out scholarships. He promised me a scholarship. He looked my parents in the eye and he said, after a couple years, after we make this transition into the Atlantic 10, that you know, your son will have a, a scholarship. And he owned up to that. You know, he kept his promise and, and you know, here we are. Jermon has been so good to this university. They have a bye week, Towson's at home, Jermon's at the football game. The biggest thing for me was my friendships from Towson University. We had a lot of fun, we played a lot of football, we had a lot of fun, we graduated, we had a lot of fun. We got married, we settled down, we have kids, and to see that kind of growth through guys that you grinded with, you struggled with, you had success with, you failed with, I think that's the biggest thing that, I, that I've taken away from, you know, from my time at university is, is the love and the friendship and the continuity of the guys that I came in with, the guys that came before me, and the guys that came after me. Towson is a family. You have squabbles, you have problems, but there's a loyalty, I mean, you look at Rich Bader, who is told he can't coach football anymore, and he stays. You look at Gordy Combs, who gets let go. He's now doing radio. I'm telling you, something gets in your blood, and, 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 and you don't want to leave. Gordy, you were a super coach. You had a lot of things going for you. And uh, the main thing you had going for you is your personality and how you got along with your kids. That means a lot. Well, I think when I look back over it, you know, we had, we've had a long time together. Uh, you, were, you as a player, coach, head coach, your loyalty. Uh, you know, I knew Gordy was going to be loyal to the program. He was going to be faithful. And I appreciate that. So I, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I love you. And thank God for you. Thank you. Well, I'm not sitting here without you. You continued the line of loyalty to this place that I didn't even know I was learning. Without knowing it, you probably made the biggest difference in my life outside of my parents than anyone else on the planet. And for that, myself and my family are truly, truly grateful. Thank you. Mm, thank you, sir. When you guys would talk about Rob as a coach, you know, when he took our team in the year that Joe Lee was the quarterback, he threw for 4,000 yards. And the next year, Noah Reed mm -hmm. ran for over 1,000 yards. The big thing about football is you got to play with the guys you're handed. And that's what he did when he was the offensive coordinator. And I knew he was going to be a good head coach. And he's proven that.
beginning of Coach Ambrose's era was pretty legendary. Coach Ambrose's era started at 5 a.m. I remember the winter workouts, hearing about them from some of the old heads, and we really didn't know what to expect going into it. We were definitely in for a wake-up call. Coach Ambrose talked about commitment, buying in. Those uh, were, were key words that he used a lot. I definitely learned the definition of commitment at Towson University. We had two rough years at the beginning, but by the third year, we really were in our stride and it showed us that this working out really early, it, it paid off to the point that we won a conference championship. The West around the left side. He could walk into the end zone. Touchdown, Towson University Tigers. Being an offensive lineman, I got to block for Terrence West. It was a great privilege, but it was bigger than him. It, it all took you know, a full commitment from the entire team to really you know, grow and win that conference championship. Touchdown, Tigers! We fought and we battled, and then we ended our season at Rhode Island. I remember as a recruit from Baltimore City, Ambrose just telling us, if you stick it out, you'll be a champion, and you can create history. I just remember after that game, looking at my friend CJ, who also was from Baltimore, and saying, hey man, we did it. And got the CAA championship, this ring. You have an institution's gratitude. You have your peers' respect. You have each other's love. And now you have a conference title that no one can ever take. Woo! Realizing that we did something that no one had done in the Division I level was, was amazing. It was mind-blowing to us. And then we rode the bus all the way back from Rhode Island. And getting back here and seeing the fans that were on the track at 1, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., it was, it was mind-blowing. We were able to kind of enjoy and celebrate with our fans at the place that it all began. Getting off the buses and just knowing that everything that we went through on these fields and seeing the fans was like the final culmination of something great. Being a part of history like that is something that I hold dearly and I'm happy I'm going to be able to tell my kids one day. Here with Terrence West, the first winner of the Jerry Weiss Award, which is awarded to the top freshman in FCS football. In 2011, Terrence West is the freshman of the year, and I'm the national coach of the year. And because of that, we have to go to the national championship game. And they present the awards during that weekend and all that good stuff, and we go out on the field. And, and it was awesome, because Terrence and I are on the field together, and we're standing alone, and we're walking off. And he looks at me and goes, we're coming back here, and we're wearing pads. I'm like. You're damn right we are. And two years later, we did. The FCS Championship. We come to you from Frisco, Texas. The number one seed, a two-time defending champ, North Dakota State, against the Towson Tigers, who are seeking their first ever FCS Championship. Playing for the National Championship against a team that we had played historically at a different level, that's kind of weird. We are the only school in the history of the country to go to the playoffs in Division I, Division II, and Division III. When you look at the entire context of Towson season, no shame in losing to what is an all-time team. But what Rob Ambrose has done at Towson, now they've become a power in the Colonial, and they have staying power. This team is not going away. Rob Ambrose has built a program. For 50 years, somehow, we found a way in all three divisions. That says a ton about the guys that played here, and it says a ton about the men who coached them. I'll tell you what, we were, we were very fortunate to have uh, Carl Rump, Phil Albert, and Gordy, and, and Rob now, but we were very fortunate to have those, those men guide the programs because they had a love for and a passion for winning, obviously, but also they cared about people. Over 50 years, so many people have put so much time, effort, sweat into this program. I don't think people realize how many people have dedicated their lives to this football program, and I salute every one of them. And it's been an honor for me to be a part of it for 40 years. 
I've met some of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life from Towson football. I love this program. There is something about this town and this school that once you're here, you really appreciate being here and that each coach in his tenure here, and I can speak specifically for the last three, have all had opportunities to go somewhere else and chose to stay. To have a guy who's willing to stay here, Phil Albert was an assistant, became a head coach. Gordy was an assistant, became a head coach. Same thing with Rob. I know he went somewhere else, but he was an assistant here. So again, just that continuity and people that want to stay here aren't looking at it as a springboard to something else, I think says a lot, and that goes a long way. Come on, come here. You start off as a team, but you end up as a family. And I don't think never is that more evident than it is here. We got a family. Take care of each other, take care of yourselves, have some fun, get off your feet, go enjoy yourself, come on. Families are not perfect. Families are not social media highlight snippets of life. Seriously, sometimes families are rough and it, it's hard. But if you ever said to another guy that played ball here, no matter what decade he played, I need help with this you will get an answer immediately, and you will get the right answer. It's something special about this place. It's not, it doesn't have bells and whistles. It's, maybe it's the crucible of the experience that has created that bond, but it is tighter here than a lot of places I've ever seen. Take care of each other, without exception. One, two, three, hey. We gotta win this game. We gotta win this game. As a senior, I feel like this year is a special year. You're supposed to always go out with a bang. Chum, 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 chum. As a team, it's just one goal to win the championship. We got it. Got a chunk, Cody. Over here, corner over. Whenever I see Monty Fenner, I, I think of Wardell Turner. Uh, just the way he flies around the field and his tenacity to get to the ball reminds me of Wardell and how he played the game. Good job. Good job. We started the Wardell Turner Scholarship to make sure that Wardell's name was never forgotten. We wanted to leave a lasting legacy for him and his family. Let me get it one more time. Everybody deserves a second chance. We chose Monty Fenner for the Wardell Turner Scholarship because Coach Ambrose truly felt that he embodied everything that, that Wardell represented. That I represent him means a lot. I'm trying to walk every day with a purpose. You know, for the people that knew him. Wardell Turner, to me, he was a teammate. Uh, I know that sounds simple, but teammate is everything. Uh, teammate is family. One, two, three, family. We wanted something that his family could be proud of, because to me, he embodied everything that Towson is and should be. And I also wanted to make sure that the next generations of players that come through Towson and, and students that come through Towson would remember Wardell and who he was. Someone back home told Wardell that he grew up in Nanticoke, but Towson growed him up. <laughs> when he got to Towson, he was rough, he was raw, but he went with the mission. That mission was to be able to provide a life for us after college. At Towson, my husband was able to make uh, friendships that lasted an entire lifetime, it lasted for the rest of his life. Number 40, Wardell was our leader on special teams. He kept everybody up, he kept everybody encouraged, and he would get just as excited as though he made the big hit. And it, it, it's a powerful thing seeing this picture and seeing Bill Stupp in uniform and Wardell being excited and pointing that we've got the ball. That picture kind of mirrors what he would do later in life. The same way that he had to support his teammate, his players, later in life when he became a Sergeant Major, he had to do that with his soldiers. And so their successes were his successes. And I remember him saying that Playing on a football team prepared him for life. It prepared him for his leadership in the military.
In Afghanistan, two U.S. troops died in a bombing attack in Kabul today, the latest in a new surge of violence. On that Sunday, I was having a conversation with my mother on the telephone, and I said, Mom, I said, I don't even know how the conversation started, but I remember saying, you know, Wardell has been a good husband. He is a good man. And God forbid, should anything ever happen to him, I will never remarry. He's just such a good man. That Monday, I got the news the very next day. That, um, I was at work, and I will never forget. They said, uh, Mrs. Turner, are you the wife of Sergeant Major Wardell Turner? I said, yes. And he said, on behalf of the United States of America, I would like to inform you that Sergeant Major Wardell Turner succumbed, has succumbed. I hate that word, I still, he said he has succumbed. He has succumbed to his injuries. Under a clear blue sky on a windswept January afternoon, family members huddled in the bitter cold to remember Sergeant Major Wardell Turner. Sergeant Major Turner leaves behind his mother, his wife, five children, and three grandchildren. He was 48 years old. Wardell Turner was just a good old country boy, and anyone that knew him would tell you that he's just a good old country boy. He was a family man that believed, he believed in the ethos of this country, which he served under. He was a man of integrity, and he always said, always leave a place better than you found it. I think the, the mission that Doc Minigan set out to accomplish has been accomplished many times over. And Wardell was the epitome of that. A lot of great things that have happened in this program in the past and you've upped the ante you have raised the bar we are different we are not common we are not we are different don't talk go show them. our family our way one two three hey! Hey!